The NHL season is upon us, and our strategy is to stay positive, but test negative. Welcome to the HockeyDebates.com podcast. I'm Bob Duff, and as always, I'm joined by my uh, Hall of Fame co-host, uh, Kevin Allen, and why don't you introduce our guest today, Kevin? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Our guest, and uh, we've had him on before, and he's one of our more popular guests, Mike Heike of the uh, uh, DallasStars.com, who's uh, been covering that team for a number of years, and nobody knows it better than he does. And But, uh, Mike, did you ever think that you'd have to become an expert on uh, viruses in order to cover the Dallas Stars? No. Uh, you know, it's funny. Even the bubble last year, they took care of everything so well. It, it really wasn't an issue, but, I mean, this is this is weird. And uh, they're holding practices right now with 15 guys sidelined, and um, they're pushing their start be- uh, date back. Rick Bonus today said he thinks it'll be uh, January 22nd at home against Nashville, which means they'd have postponed four games and have to make those up at some point in time during the season. So, yeah, it's weird right now. Well, you know, I've told, uh, actually warned uh, my readers that this is going to be similar to the NFL. And, um, I mean, you know, we have to cross our fingers that we don't have any bad cases, but you know, the, uh, athletes as a general rule are quite healthy and they'll survive, uh, uh, COVID. It may not be comfortable for all of them, but I think we're going to see a lot of this. The only difference is, you know, in the NFL, you know, you miss one game, uh, and you're going to miss multiple games, uh, in the NHL when you're on the COVID list, but maybe this is a blessing for the Dallas stars that they get all of their guys. Um, you know, through this now, and uh, this may be the only outbreak they have all season, which could be a good thing. Yeah, that would be. Uh, you know, it's interesting because their whole philosophy is built around being a better team at the end of the season, and that's when they'll get Ben Bishop back. That's when they'll get Tyler Sagan back. Um, you know, you don't want to dig too big of a hole, but because of this divisional format, you can dig out of holes pretty quickly because you're playing the teams that you're trying to catch. So, yes, you can dig a big hole by losing to those teams, but then you can get back out. And I hate to, you know, put low expectations on them, but if they finish anywhere fourth and above, they'll be pretty darn, darn happy. Well, that's the thing about this year, too. You say you don't want to dig too much of a hole, but only four teams out of eight in the division are going to make the playoffs, and there's no wild card format. So it makes things uh, a little more uh, concerting when you, you do get off to a slow start. Yeah, definitely. And the good thing for them is they were they went off to a, a slow start last year. Um, they were eh, kind of messing around in the bubble a little bit. They were in jeopardy of going down 3-1 against Calgary, uh, but they came back from all that. And then the other weird thing is they find themselves behind after first periods quite a bit last season. And so they were, they were the team always uh, fighting to catch up. So I think their mindset is such that they, they will feel that they can dig out of a hole if they get in one. Uh, Mike, I asked you to put your epidemiology hat on to discuss the virus. Now I need your orthopedic hat. Uh, fill us in a little bit about uh, what uh, we think is going to happen with Sagan and Bishop. You said later in the year. Can you be any more specific in that, or is that as general as uh, they've uh, given you? Well, the original targets for both were March, and I thought it was mid-March, but now they're talking more late March, and I've even heard people mention April with Sagan. Uh, he's got a hip injury surgery uh, that he's had to have. Um, and when you layer that on the fact he's had an Achilles tendon, he's had knee, he's like over the past five years, he's had a lot of times that he's been banged up. Um, so it will be very interesting to see how he comes back. Um, and then Bishop is a knee. He says it's no big deal. He says that he can get through it. I think they're uh, targeting him for mid-March. Um, and so we'll see. Uh, he also has a history of being injured. Um, but, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world for him. If he does come back, if he has a month to get into game shape, and if they make the playoffs, and he could be their number one goalie. Well, I, Jeff Blaschel, the Red Wings coach, was saying he's talked a lot to uh, coaches with, and staff with the Lions and the Tigers and to kind of get a handle on how they've dealt with you know, playing outside the bubble and dealing with COVID and protocol and precautions and that is the same thing kind of going on in Dallas, you know, you know the stars kind of consulting with the other Dallas teams that have been through this. And I guess the Mavericks are kind of, you know, in a similar mode to the stars right now, but they're kind of a few weeks ahead of the, 
the curve, they've already started playing games and encountered some issues. So I, I, I would imagine there's kind of a, a lot of cross-referencing and comparing notes going on. I think there could be. I, I don't know that Rick Bonus is open to that kind of stuff. He's a old, grizzled hockey guy who talks to hockey people. Um, he says he doesn't even really talk to the other coach much. Like we were talking about the bubble. I mean, you're in the bubble with them. They're eating lunch at a table, you know, two, two over. Wouldn't you go and chat them up and see what's going on? And he said he prefers not to. He prefers to focus only on his team. Uh, we even asked him about, you know, okay, well, you're playing new teams, Tampa or um, Florida or Columbus. And, and these are interesting teams, too, because Florida and Columbus could go woo, way up or they could go way down. And so you, I would want to talk to anybody I could. And he really believes in the philosophy of if we do what we do best, then everything will be fine. Now, I can't speak for Jim Nill or uh, Dave Zeiss, the athletic trainer, or any of the others. But when you talk to Rick Bonus, he likes to stay in his own little house and take care of things there. So I'll ask about it. But, I mean, I, every indication I get from them is they're trying to take care of this themselves. Wow, that sounds like he's related to the Sutter brothers. That's always their <laughs> approach. He is, I will um, tell you what, like he's a funny, nice guy, but he is old school hockey. Yeah. And, you, know, you, you, you know, you've you know, you talked to the Sutters. You've talked to guys like that. That's how he thinks. He's, he's 65 years old. Yeah, no, I, I've talked to Rick. I know him as well. And, he, you know, he's always uh, well-liked wherever he's yes. been. I mean, he's very popular. Uh, people like him. He's just a, you know, a down-home, uh, you know, hockey guy. Uh, Mike, I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe you didn't get much out of bonus about moving into the new uh, division, but, you know, you've been around a long time. You know those teams. In that division. Uh, I think it'll be really interesting. The uh, the West was so top heavy, uh, and and I think a lot of people thought they were going to end up in the West. Um, but at the same time, if they really want to finish fourth, you know, the odds of finishing in the top four I thought were better out there. This division, like I really, I think Florida should be better. I think Bobrovsky will be better. I think Quenville, you know, will be more comfortable in his second year. I think Columbus is a wild card. You, you just have no idea what they're going to do. Carolina's up there. Um, Nashville, I think, could be a good team. I think Hines, you know, getting uh, another, you know, getting a full start, full season, so to speak, uh, could help them. So especially with the Stars starting four games late and, you know, potentially, you know, not having all their players ready, uh, it, it will be a battle. Um Tampa's Tampa. I think Tampa is hands down the best team in the division. And then it's almost like, you know, uh, nothing against Detroit, uh, but it's like Detroit and Chicago at the bottom and the other the five teams in the middle just kind of fighting for three spots. Well, yeah, I think that's that's fair. I think I have Dallas uh, third, but I see them in the three, four spot. I think Carolina will finish second. I, yeah. you know, they're a team on the rise. You look at their, you know, with Svichnikov and, uh, um, you know, Aho. I mean, those are young stars that are only getting better. Um, so I, I think they're a team. The only question about Carolina is the one we've had for three years, and that's goaltending. Yeah. And yet somehow Mrazek has gotten it done. He hasn't been uh, exceptional, but he's been fine, and they're happy with him. So it's gonna, it is going to be interesting. I think it will be a, a fight for Dallas uh, in that uh, division to get in the playoffs. And uh, oh, if I one more question for you, I want to ask you about. I meant to ask you the question before on a follow up. What's your thought on Kudobin being kind of a number one? He's really not sort of uh, faced that, uh, at least from the mental perspective of you know he's the guy. You know you don't have any other uh, option there. Where usually he's just known as the best backup goalie in the NHL. Yeah, I think the the question marks are what is you know really going to hurt in the goaltending because when you had Bishop and Hudobin, you were like, well, they'll figure it out. You know, either right. Hudobin will do it, Bishop will do it. You'll switch them back and forth. Well, now you have Hudobin moving into a number one spot, which he's never done before, and Jake Ottinger playing, I think, a pretty significant role. He's a first round draft pick, but he's never played, never started an NHL game. So, again, you're just going into question marks. Could they be great? They could. I think Ottinger has shown in the HL and, and even up in the bubble, uh, he came in and I think stopped eight shots in two different games in backup role. Um, he could be fine. Uh, but 
we talked to Hudobin. If you guys, if anybody gets a chance to watch any kind of Hudobin Zoom call, he's hilarious. So he answers his phone in the middle of the Zoom call and says, hey, uh, I can't talk. I'm doing an interview right now. And then hangs up on the guy. <laughs> <laughs> then he was talking about uh, how Ottinger uh, is a really nice, good guy who wants to learn. And he said, and I don't know if I can use this on your podcast, but he said, he goes, he's not like those other goalies, young goalies who have big balls, <laughs> you know, because they, you know, he, and you're just like, what, how is that coming out of your mouth? And then when the interview's over, he's trying to click out. He's going like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And then finally he clicks out and he goes, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's his mindset. And so he had COVID in the off season, had to get over that, had hand surgery, had to get over that, had immigration issues. So he came back late. So yesterday was his first practice and he was, everybody says, yeah, he's fine. Nothing bothers him. Nothing phases him. He played 25 games in the playoffs last year. He went 14 and 10, went six and one in overtime. Um, he just seems to thrive on whatever chaos is out there. And, and he's just calm and all of it. So in that regard, he's a 34 year old goalie who's coming off, you know, quote unquote, his first run as a number one in the playoffs. And he's got all the confidence in the world that he can do it. I've always thought, you know, Losing in the Stanley Cup final, you kind of get all of the uh, detriment of being in that without the reward. Every team Dallas plays this year, they're going to look upon them. Those guys went to the finals last year. They're really good, but they didn't get to lift the cup. So they've kind of got to deal with the same things that Tampa Bay is going to deal with this year without the rewards. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I've studied a bunch of teams. Um, they believe that they are one of those teams that's on the rise. So losing in seven games and overtime to St. Louis was one of the steps. They took the next step in losing in the finals. And we've seen teams like Tampa Bay or, you know, teams in the past like Detroit or Dallas or Colorado, where losing in the finals actually helps you take the next step. Uh, but I've also seen Calgary and Edmonton. And, you know, this is a team that wasn't uh, one of the top five in the league in any statistical, well, in goals against. But they weren't a great record team. They weren't a great power play team. They weren't a great penalty kill team. They weren't a great goal scoring team. So those are the teams that have taken the next step after getting the experience. So the fear is they were just a fluke, but they got lucky. Uh, I mean, they beat some good teams. They beat uh, Colorado and Vegas. Uh, on their way there. So they earned that, but can they do it again? I, it's a real good argument to say they might be a fluke um, and it's up to them to prove they're not. Mike, do you have uh, any sense that anyone's having a hard time with, uh, you know, the virus? Uh, obviously it affects everyone differently. Uh, yeah. Uh, different. Uh, Hudobin said that he, he lost his smell and uh, that it was hard just walking upstairs. Like, you know, he said, you know, he goes, you're not winded. I'm not like on oxygen or anything, but when I walk up to the third floor, I'm winded. And you, this is a top level athlete. Yeah. So yeah, he, he said it really did kick him pretty hard. Um, now the guys that are currently battling it, I don't know. They listed six as, you know, actual people with COVID 15 are out. So my guess is those two had contact with other, or those players had contact um, so those players, I don't think, have shown any signs. And I've not heard that any player is really getting hit hard by it. But it was interesting talking to Hudobin today because you just – that's a little bit surprising. I mean, top-level athlete saying that, you know, he was winded after climbing two flights of stairs. Yeah. No, it's and it seems to affect everyone differently. I, You know, my daughter had it. And, uh, um, you know, the thing that we've noticed with her is the, fat the fatigue lingers. And that, you know, that's the issue uh, that I think athletes probably have to deal with. And I, I know I heard that a little bit in the NFL that some of the players, even after they were over it, thought that their uh, energy level wasn't as high. So um, yeah. sure I think uh, the Cowboys, uh, uh, Zeke had a, what would be called not a great year and he had it. And a lot of people thought he looked like he had lingering fatigue. Yeah. But yeah, it does. It affects everybody differently. I guess the, the positive you can spin out of this is you look at baseball and uh, football, you know, a lot of the teams that did have a COVID outbreak during the season, you know, you look at Baltimore and Tennessee and the NFL and the Cardinals and the uh, Marlins and Major League Baseball, they all made the playoffs. So maybe this is a good thing to go. Yeah. And I mean, 
it's funny watching this over the last couple of years that adversity can make you stronger. And this, this team has really embraced whatever adversity, whether that's they fire a coach in the middle of the season or, you know, they, they have to get shut down for COVID or they, you know, the current COVID situation or whatever they have to do up in the bubble. That has seemed to bring out some, a real mental toughness in a lot of players. And, you know, these guys are a little bit older, the Jamie Benz, the Blake Comos, um, you know, they're, the fact that they have had to really dig in hard, I think has brought out the best in them. Uh, we got to let you go. But before we do one final question, what are we going to see out of Jamie Benn this season? Obviously in the playoffs, we saw the, the old Jamie Benn for spurts. Might we see him again? Yeah, I think you could. Um, so much of what he does is one, getting him into quote unquote beast mode. Um, and so then whether that's up to the coaches, the players, the opposition, you know, whatever flips his switch on that night, uh, they have to find a way to get him into that mode. And maybe he can't do it for even 56 games. Maybe he has to save it for, for key spots. Uh, but the other thing is getting him on the right line. And him and Sagan and Radulov have been together for quite a while, and that's a good line, and it can be really good. Uh, but it also, you know, you just see uh, their minds wander. I mean, these are veteran guys who they need to be excited about playing. And so with Sagan out, uh, they've put him on a line with Rope Hintz and Denis Kirianov. And that's their top line right now. And everybody, you know, says, Stars fans say, we need to get uh, Hintz more minutes. We need to get Giriano more minutes. Well, it looks like that's going to be the 18-minute line right there. And if Jamie Benn is playing with those two who are fired up every night and have a lot of speed, uh, they could drag him into the battle and then he could be more consistent. All right, Mike. Well, as always, we appreciate having you on. We appreciate your insight. Uh, I'm sure as the season moves along and Dallas gets in the thick of it, we'll have you back to talk about their chances. That would be fun. I, I am I am interested about this format because, you know, it isn't the same old, same old. It's going to be really different I, with a lot of different storylines. I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. I think it's going to be highly entertaining. I think the only – Problem is, is we might like it too much, and I don't, I, I, I don't think we're going to switch to this permanently because there's too many issues. But I do predict this will lead to a uh, realignment. We got Seattle coming in, and we're going to see some things that we can change. So I, I, I'm, I'm guessing we'll see a realignment that will come out of this. We won't see an all Canadian division, or you know, we're not going to see uh, Dallas uh, playing in the East. But I think we're going to see some changes as a result of this. Yeah, and I like the two uh, two team two games in the same place on uh, either back to back, or I think we're going to see that in the future too. Me too. Sounds good. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. All right, we'll talk to you guys later. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was Mike Heike, of course, of the uh, Dallas Stars uh, dot com, who uh, and he covered it uh, for the local newspaper there for many years as well, and uh, really kind of knows the Dallas Stars probably better than anyone who um, covers that team down there, and. Um, uh, you know, Bob, I agree with his assessment, too. I, I think it is, you know, the Tampa Bay Lightning on top, and it's the Blackhawks and the Red Wings on the bottom, and then everybody else in the middle. And uh, I, I think Carolina is a little bit better than than everyone else. But, you know, I wouldn't argue with anybody that wants to lump them in there as well. Yeah, I mean, it's um, – I think the hardest thing in sports has got to be – to lose, like people say it's to lose in the semifinals because you don't get to the final, but I think it's to lose the final because you battle, especially in a situation like the NHL where you battle that many games to get there and then you don't get the, the reward that you fought so hard for. It's just so heartbreaking. And then to have to come right back and play the next year. I mean, history shows us. I think it's been, you know, just the 2009 Penguins since. Uh, the mid 1980s that have been able to come back and win the cup the next year after losing the final. So it, it, it obviously, you know, the numbers bear it out that it is a difficult thing to do two years in a row. Well, for sure. And uh, you know, as, as Mike was talking about it, I agree with your assessment. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's really not a stepping stone uh, to reach the final. Um, and I, I think there's uh you know, a mental issue that comes from losing there. You've climbed all the way to the summit, but, you know, you don't get to celebrate. Um, and you know how hard it is to, uh, you know, the journey that uh, got you there and you got to try to repeat it. I, I think it's overwhelming. Um, and, uh, you know, you just look at the teams that have reached the final and they haven't been able to do them. I mean, 
Tampa Bay did, um, you know, get to the, uh, you know, uh, has had extended runs, but not right before they won the cup. Um, you know, that was several years after that. Um, so, uh, you know, I think they've learned all along, uh, they being the light, the lightning. And I, I'll tell you this, I, I don't, uh, discount, uh, it's, it's really difficult to repeat. I mean, we've only had two teams, the Penguins in 2016, 17, and, uh, the, you know, the Red Wings 97, 98 over the last 25 years. Um, but, uh, uh, I think that the, the lightning could do it. I really do. Yeah, and I think if uh, you look at the situation with the goaltending, I think that's going to be a real issue for Dallas because I think with this condensed schedule and these back-to-back games in the same city, and that you're you're going to need two capable goalies. You're not going to be able to ride a guy for fifty out of fifty-six games. I don't think. I think that's you know one of the reasons why Montreal getting Jake Allen to have be able to finally have a guy behind Carey Price that they can trust is a big deal. But, you know, if Jake Ottinger isn't up to the the task, that's going to be a real problem for Dallas. Yeah. I You know, I have some faith in him because I think uh, I remember his draft year and how the scouts were really sold on him. But uh, to be, you know, brutally honest, I haven't followed him since he's, you know, turned pro. But from what I've uh, read, uh, you know, he's been a top prospect goalie. But, you know, there is a lot to be said for experience in the net um, and dealing with those uh, – um, you know, went back to back games and, you know, the, um, I, I, I think the backup role is just so much harder than the starting role. I, you know, it, it's just more complicated. Uh, you know, when you know, you're going to play, you know, you can go through your routine and all that. A backup's got to be ready to go all the time. You never knows, you know, for sure. And I think it's just much more complicated for a younger player, you know, to, to be in that, uh, in that role. But, you know, speaking of how many games they'll play, like I, I, I would guess that the split is going to be kind of like uh 38, 18 or, uh, you know, 37, 19 in terms of the number one versus number two goalie, just based on, you know, the conversations we're hearing from, you know, coaches now, but I, I would bet there are going to be a couple of, of goalies that will play 40 games. Now, one of them will be Vasilevsky, I'm sure, who's young and strong. But here's the funny thing about that, of, the, the, of what I'm going to say here, because I agree with you. They brought Jake Allen in Montreal because they wanted to have this great tandem and they knew what the season um, you know, could end up being. But I think Carey Price, if he plays as well as I think he's going to play, I think he'll play 40 games, <laughs> You know, just because I think when he's – Going well, he plays better when he plays all the time. So I, it'll be interesting to see because, you know, I think they want to keep him fresh. They all saw what Tuka Rask was able to do a couple of seasons ago when uh, he was well rested, when Halak played a lot of games, and then and then uh, Rask was lights out in the in the playoffs. Um, so, um, you know, I think there's uh, people thinking now that rest is a uh, is much better uh, for goalies. You know, I, I, I don't think like defensemen and forwards need as much rest uh, or taking a game off here and there. Sometimes they, you know, they do that, but I, I think goalies do need it. Speaking of Halak and Ross, I read the other day, Bruce Cassidy, the Bruins coach saying that one of the uh, COVID protocols they've implemented is that Rask and Halak, are not allowed to be together ever off the ice because they don't want both of them getting sick. Well, it's the, it's the Denver Broncos rule. Mm-hmm. You know, the Denver Broncos quarterbacks all went to, you know, I've said before that, you know, no, the power play meeting should all be done um, on zoom uh, because you don't want, the, you know, your power play sitting in a room together because uh, the Denver Broncos, all the quarterbacks would go in and review film and they didn't wear masks. And so when they uh, when one of the quarterbacks got COVID, they all, you know, had to go on the uh, on the COVID list because uh, you know they had been exposed. And uh, so for that reason, that makes totally sense. That uh, may, it makes a lot of sense that you would make sure your goalies don't hang out, uh, you know, together. Um, you know, a lot of people complain that the Broncos got the short end of the stick in that deal, having to play basically a wide receiver at quarterback, but. That was why, because it was their own club. Correct. And you wonder, I haven't really heard anything specific from the NHL 
on how they will deal with that type of situation. It's interesting. I've been writing some British rugby lately and they put in a COVID rule that if it's your team's fault that a game gets canceled because of COVID, you get the loss and the other team gets the win by forfeit. Wow. Well, that's, that's, that's kind of harsh because sometimes it's nobody's fault. Yeah. You know, like well, if, it's, if they can determine that, you yeah. know, one team that had all the up, one team has a COVID outbreak and the other team's ready to play. That's the way they do it. Yeah. yeah one team's good to go and you can't answer the bell. Then you, you take the loss by forfeit. Yeah. Well, I certainly know there's uh, excitement in the air tonight. Uh, you know, tonight's open and we got a game at five 30 um, yeah. with, uh, you know, the battle of Pennsylvania. And I saw. Oh no, you told me. You told me that it's the first time that the Flyers um, have been favored against the Penguins in how long? Fifteen games. I was surprised. You know, you know, Philly. You look at Philly as being a tough place to win, and yet Pittsburgh was favored in a lot of games. In Philly, you know? granted, Philly until the last uh, year or two probably wasn't on Pittsburgh's level, but you know. Historically, when you think about Philadelphia, you just think it's a really tough place for a visiting team to go in and win. So to see Pittsburgh have the edge in that many games in a row was very surprising. Well, and that's a real underrated rivalry, too. Uh, you know, when we talk about rivalries, we talk Boston and Montreal, Islanders and, you know, Rangers and that that sort of thing. Even Pittsburgh and Washington, uh, you know, has become very good rivals. But the Flyers... Um, because it's one part of the state versus another part of the state. Uh, I remember the story when the Stanley Cup was brought to the State House in Harrisburg after the Penguins won it. The Flyers fans stood on the balcony and booed when the cup came in the in the thing. I mean that you know that's that's some intense uh, uh, you know rivalry when you got that going on when the Stanley Cup gets booed. Uh, so um, I, I, I think this new division setup, will allow us to um, even see more of that, you know, kind of rivalry. And I think we'll probably see more penalty minutes this season because the hostility will be higher because this is original six style uh, competition, you know, eight games against uh, each other. And, uh, you know, by the time you play and, you know, they'll be back to back too. Um, sometimes there'll be a game a day in between, but, um, you know, you're going to play the, uh, if you're the Ranger, you could play the Islanders on Tuesday and then the Islanders on Wednesday. Um, and if there's a COVID, I, I wonder if we're going to see uh, three games in a row. Because if you notice, you look at the schedule, you know, they've left some uh, ga days between. And, you know, if it, that's the only day you can get it in, will we see three games in a row? It'll be interesting to see. And I think that's, you know, one advantage of this format. And I'm sure it's one of the reasons why they went with it. If you do get in a situation where you've got to make up games, which, you know, the NBA already finds itself in, the NBA didn't go with this type of format. So they're really scrambling to figure out how to make up these games. Well, if you're only playing against six or seven other teams, as you say, you're going to play that team a lot. So there's going to be ample opportunity to squeeze an extra game in somewhere if you have to. Uh, and I did want to talk and bring up about the outdoor games and, uh, you know, and, the, and picturesque Lake Tahoe. And uh, the reason I want to talk about them is, is because I have been saying for a long time that when we run out of historic venues and, you know, we're moving in that direction, you know, there aren't uh, many of the, you know, certainly uh, all the vintage stadiums, Wrigley Field, Fenway Park, you know, we've been to. I started saying we need to go to neutral sites. Like I'd love to see a game in Lambeau Field on the frozen tundra. Uh, and then when we're done with those, we need to just go to some picturesque areas. Like I'd love to, you know, you could go to Vail, Colorado, where you got a pretty good chance it's going to snow and uh, on, on uh, New Year's and just create a rink in a picturesque uh, setting and play there. You can go to Squaw Valley. Uh, just like they're going to Lake Tahoe to play. I I really like that concept of going to, uh, you know, just areas where we'll just have picturesque surroundings. You can go to some place, not mystery, but you go to some place in Alaska and uh, create a, a an outdoor rink that would be a picturesque uh, setting with the caribou running amok and, and, and so forth. I think that would be a lot of fun to do that. And certainly, you know, Banff, Lake Louise, and Alberta, those would be 
ideal spots to do it in Canada. For sure. And uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, I just think that's, uh, that's the way to go. And, you know, I'm always disappointed when uh, national columnists, you know, start uh, ripping on the uh, winter classic uh, uh, because they say, well, it's lost its uniqueness, but you know, they, they don't understand that the, you know, oftentimes um, not often, always, um, you know, within that city, it's still a happening. It's an event. Uh, people want to be there. People want to go just because it's lost its lure as a TV event. Well, sometimes it, it can't be about just about the TV. You know, it has to be about what's happening there. And they're a big moneymaker because they sell out and they're surrounded by a lot of different events. And even if you did them in Vale um, or, uh, you know, Squaw Valley or Alaska, they would still be big events. People would want to go there. They'd want to, you know, you know, the tickets would be astronomical on the secondary market. If you were only, you know, if you were playing in Squaw Valley and you only created temporary stands and played uh, in front of, say, 35,000 people, those 35,000 tickets, <laughs> uh, particularly if you had a high-profile team like the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, New York Rangers, uh, you know, Boston Bruins, uh, they would be uh, so coveted uh, and uh, – They'd, uh, I bet they'd go for the cost of Super Bowl tickets, especially if it was like the Maple Leafs. It's funny because years ago, I remember having a conversation with Colin Campbell, and he was big on that idea. He thought they should look to do these picturesque kind of settings, and he said he got a lot of backlash at the governor's meetings because all they wanted was numbers. You know, They wanted to play at Michigan Stadium and sell 100,000 tickets. And all they were thinking about was revenue, and he was thinking about you know, the majesty of it all and making, you know, making it an event like we're talking about, you know, once in a lifetime kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I see both sides of that. I mean, I think you can do it all. Um, you know, this event, I don't think we've exhausted the possibilities and, but, you know, you can just play in so many hundred thousand seat stadiums and then, you know, that's lost its luster too. But, you know, we haven't played at Penn state yet. And I think flyers and penguins at Penn state, um, is a natural, um, and, uh, you know, there are still some stadiums that we can go to where you can probably uh, do that. And there's really no reason why we can't go back to, uh, Fenway park or to, uh, to Wrigley field. Those are, you know, top flight venues and, uh, uh, where people want to see the historic nature of it. So, um, I, I still think we have uh, a number of years left on the winter classic. That's what I'm saying. Well, what we don't have is a lot of time left again to talk because we've gone over the limit once more. We we don't do the 30 minutes very well. We wouldn't be good if we worked at Domino's because we always go over our limit. No. Yeah, we'd have to give the pizzas free because yeah. we'd get them there in 32 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll be back with you. Are we going to do it again tomorrow, Kevin? Uh, yeah, we, we, can, we can do it tomorrow for sure. Yeah, better find a guest then. Yeah. Tomorrow and uh, talk some more hockey, and we'll actually have some hockey to talk about because there's games today. So uh, join us again tomorrow. This has been the Hockey Debates Podcast. I'm Bob. He's Kevin, and we look forward to talking about actual NHL results tomorrow. See you then. <laughs>